One. Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Let's kick off another edition of the 1113 diesel engine assembly series. Um, I want to show you one little improvement I made to the engine here was I installed these turnbuckles on all four corners, attached them down to the cart that the engine is on just to stabilize things a little bit because as I assemble this is going to become rather unbalanced and it is nice and sturdy on there now solid as a rock i would sure hate to see that go rolling off the side so the goal of this video is to make 1113's new engine gain some weight this would be the weight 42 pounds of it by the way it's such a substantial casting i had to go throw it on the scale the other other day and weigh it just out of curiosity and that's 42 pounds with it being stripped down stripping it down was pretty simple you have this little bolt here that all it does is just seal this threaded hole. That's why it has this thick copper washer under it. It's just kind of a plug bolt. I've still never really figured that one out. And then these studs that go around here are for the fuel filter tower. And these long ones go all the way out into the diesel fuel injection pump. So with those out of there, that cover stripped down. So this is what I call the intermediate front cover. Um, I'm not really sure what Cat would call it because the manual for the D3400 does not really address this piece, but this area here is what bolts onto the engine block here. Um, basically, this is kind of the unsung hero of the Cat D3400 diesel engine, in my opinion. It uh, carries out more different functions. It's kind of the multitasker of the entire engine. Um, it mounts the entire diesel engine fuel system right there. It has this passage right here, which is for water. We will flip it over. Like I said, it's about 42 pounds. It's plenty substantial. Water pump mounts on right here. So not only does it conduct all the diesel fuel activities, but it also deals with uh, coolant. It houses and retains camshaft and idler gear hub and accessory drive shaft, as well as forming the timing gear compartment for the crank, cam, idler, accessory, all that stuff going on in here. And it forms an attachment point for the engine front cover and down here on the bottom, the front radiator support. So that's why this one piece is so heavy duty. It has to perform a lot of jobs. And since 1113's original engine had froze and cracked so badly, not only did I inspect this for cracks, but I also had it tested. Um, none were found, thankfully, because this is a pretty darn nice cover. Um, I really wanted to make sure that we did not have any freeze damage, any cracking in here, because uh, this is buried so far in the engine that if there were any cracks or leak points, basically it would allow water to go right down into the crankcase. be a very, very bad thing, and it would be a ridiculous amount of work to go back in and replace this with another one. So I definitely wanted to be sure we didn't have any problems in this area here. The passages aren't that large, and everything's pretty heavy. I think that's why it fared so well. Final talking points on the cleanup process. I did my usual surface check with the flat file to make sure we did not have any pulled material around the bolt threads. You can see from the shine around some of those, virtually every threaded hole. Had a little bit of material that was standing proud, so we went over both sides, made sure everything was flat, hit all these areas in here too. Hit the spots down here, hit that uh, outlet up here for water. It's all well and good, clean and flat, ready to go. We also have the hardware here that retains this cover to the block and I want to talk once again about fold over locks. You guys know I never ever reuse these things because once they've been bent to a 90 degree angle and straightened back out again, they are fatigued enough where material is ready to crack off like you see right there. Even these other ones that fared a little bit better, once you bend that again, it's just not going to have the strength that it needs to have. So I ended up having to make six of these part number 1985-A fold over locks for this cover. It is one, two, three, four, five, and six. I had to make them because for some reason when I'm uh, 
Writing down a parts list for Ziggler Cat, I can never remember to put these darn things on there. And these are just a little bit longer fold over lock than anything else on this engine. And I ordered buku amounts and different styles of fold over locks from Cat just the other day. So I'd have everything here I could possibly need. And I forgot to put these on the list. And don't ask me what the problem is because the last time I was into one of these covers, I also forgot to put these on the list. So anyway, it's no big deal. I made six of them up. They are basically 18 gauge steel. I have sheets of that stuff around here, so no big deal. Took a hammer, flattened one of these out to use as a template, and basically just set them side by side. You can see it was pretty easy to use this for size and location of the hole. Cut out six of these things, pop the holes in, deburred them, cleaned them up 30 minutes later. I had six fold over locks, and that beats the heck out of calling Ziggler Cat. They'd most likely have to order those because not everybody needs fold over locks every day anymore. So that means at least next day to get them in stock. And then it's a two hour drive up there and back. And then you have the expense of fuel, the investment of your time, the mileage, and then the cost of the locks, which is probably the cheapest part of the whole deal. Or in 30 minutes with some material I already had on hand, I have my six locks and we can proceed. Three of them I have pre-bent to fit the slots that are in the cover. There's this one. And then we have this one up here goes into there and then this one here goes right over here. They are such a tight fit into those slots that I do take the time to pre-bend those because it's a lot easier to do it now as opposed to when I have them installed in the engine. The other three go there, there, and there can be bent at a later time when we are installing them under the bolts. And now we're just about to the point where we can put this on the engine block, but I do not have a gasket for it yet. And I called Cap just to see if they could still get me this gasket and the one for the other side for the front cover. They no longer stock those not available anywhere, so I'm going to have to make it, which is not a big deal. I do make the majority of my gaskets. Uh, very seldom do I ever buy one. Um, I did buy this one. It's the oil pan gasket. It's segmented into four pieces, and it was like $12. Um, it's kind of an expensive gasket compared to what I actually pay for gasket material. But I was thinking of my time for 12 bucks. Uh, you know, even though I'm kind of cheap, that was totally worth buying this gasket right here. I don't have to fool with it. But to make my gasket for this intermediate cover, I'm going to use this. I buy these pieces at a swap meet for a dollar each. I mean, a dollar. How many gaskets can I make out of that? It turns out I can make a lot. Uh, this is like the uh, the inner blank from an oil pan gasket, so it's good material, water resistant, oil resistant. Like I said, the guy sells these for a buck each. He's got several different thicknesses. I go to the swap meet. I buy about 10 sheets of every thickness he's got, plus a bunch of cork stuff every year, and I'm good for gaskets for 90% of the things that I need to do. Another bonus for this is that this sheet of material has enough real estate on it to allow me to pop out this intermediate cover to block gasket in one piece. So I'm not gonna have to be segmenting it in different pieces. And like I said, I buy this stuff in several different thicknesses. So in order to choose the right thickness for my application, I will take a piece of the old gasket and we'll just measure it to see about what thickness we're looking at. This one's about 24, 25 thousandths right now. We'll do a measurement of this. We are 30 right on the dot, so once we compress that by a couple thousandths, this is going to be a very close stand-in to what the factory original was. Now to make the gasket, remember we do not have to worry about any of these holes right here. That is a gasket in and of its own. We just need to come over as far as this line right here and on down and then around this edge right here. So I'll position the material in a manner in which I think I will waste the least because anything I don't use for this gasket, if it's a usable scrap large enough to potentially make another smaller gasket out of, I'll keep it. So, place it on here where I'm happy with it. I'll find where one of the bolt holes is. I'll just take the rounded end of a ball peen hammer, lightly tap. Around that hole, just enough to make a witness mark. Now we'll find another one. Do the same thing. I don't know if it's going to show on camera, but I can see 
where the witness mark is for that one and that one. So we'll go ahead and pop those out. You always want to pop the holes in a gasket first, cut out the perimeter later. Um, it's too hard to explain it, but once I get done, you'll know why. So to pop those first two holes, I'll get all the gasket making stuff out here. See, we got our scissors and a circle cutter. Old leather punches work awesome for popping out holes and gaskets. Even the little tiny ones come in handy. Um, also have a variable size kit like this. Different ends you can put on a driver. Find the one that most closely fits. The witness mark, which I believe is, yep, this one here. So we'll use that as this little uh, center punch looking thing that not only helps you determine if you're on center of the hole, but it'll actually spring back out and clear the, uh, the little blank out of there that you just cut. And my wood block, that's what you drive the punch down onto. You can see it's been well used and I've actually trimmed this down three, four times. Used to be about that long. I've made a lot of gaskets on this thing. So, get set up here. Our hammer. And line our punch with the witness mark. And pop the hole. Repeat for the other one. There we are. Now I'll place the material back onto the cover. I'll use just some hardware store bolts to drop down through those holes. That's going to help to locate this and keep it from creeping around as I pop the outlines or mark the outlines of some more of these holes. Um, if you don't put bolts in here to kind of hold everything in position, you'll start marking holes out and if this starts to migrate and move on you by the time you get down to the end, your initial holes are no, no longer going to line up. You're going to have a gasket that obstructs some of the holes, doesn't follow the lines of the surface very well. That's a lesson learned right there. Once you pop some holes, drop some bolts in, keeps that thing from moving as much as possible. Now be sure to keep dropping more bolts in as you make holes. Just carrying out that same process. The more of these bolts you can throw in these holes, the better this thing's going to retain its position while you're popping out everything else. So we're just going to use the same process, get the rest of these holes marked out and then popped in here and we'll move on to cutting out the perimeter. Okay, as you can see, I've got all the internal holes popped into the material. We'll just do a check. They all line up very well with the cover. So what we do now is start marking out the perimeter and anywhere where you have a finely machined edge of a gasket surface, you can use the same ball peen hammer method to tap out and make witness marks as you did while making the, uh, the through hole marks that we just did earlier. So as usual, we just drop some bolts in, hold everything from migrating around, and we'll just start with a machined edge Find it right there. Just start going down, making a line, creating that witness mark, and it's just like for the bolt holes. Put it over here. You can usually see a pretty clear mark that you've got going around there. So you have two options. You can either Basically, hammer on this edge until it's all the way through so you don't have to cut it, or you can go back later after you've made your witness marks all the way around, cut it out with a scissors. That's personally what I do because it, it beats up the gasket less. But either way is acceptable. So I'll get as much as, uh, sorry, as much of the perimeter marked out on this cover as is possible. And for any areas we might not be able to get on this, we can always transfer it over to the engine block. All right, sometime later I've made some progress. I've got as much of the outer perimeter 
marked out and cut out as what I could get. And then I started on the inside. I removed that piece, which I knew I did not need, and then tapped around the contours of the gasket surface around the inside, made a witness mark, and was able to remove the bulk of the interior. So we are starting to get a gasket that is looking like something now. So that's really about all the work I can do with the front cover here because I lose this line where it becomes a completely flat machined surface as well as the contours up in here. You can see we lose our clearly delineated machined edge and the gasket has to go through there. And then we also, from the old witness mark, have a large cutout up here in the top. So to get those portions marked out, we'll take this over to the engine block. Okay, about to set that on the front of the block, but you can see we have a very clearly identifiable gasket surface edge that goes down through here, and we can get a very good uh, profile along this side right here, so that's going to work pretty well. I might as well point this out right now. You'll notice we only have one dowel locator pin on the engine block up here in the corner for that intermediate cover. Uh, why only one pin? It's because that's why they stick that uh, front cam bearing out proud from the surface of the block. That's your other gigantic locating dowel for that cover. That's kind of an interesting little trivia fact that probably is completely useless and not good to know in any other situation, but you know it now. Congratulations, you're getting more like me all the time. Good thing, bad thing, we will see. So, just hold this in place with some bolts. This is just more to keep it from falling down. Just kind of locate things a bit. We'll use the old ball peen hammer and we'll just finish creating those witness marks. And with that, we've finally completed the gasket for the intermediate cover. A bit tedious, I know. I apologize if you got bored, but it fits well. Holes all line up. It is of the correct thickness and of quality material. So I see no reason why that should not work. So let's actually put something together, shall we? It's like arts and crafts time with scissors right here. Tell you what, I think if Martha Stewart was an engine builder, she would be downright jealous of this gasket right now. Let me tell you what, just gotta follow the lines. Don't stray outside of them. There we go. Last scrap piece. And that, that, Martha, if you are watching, which I am sure that you are, that is a good thing. I say, I could just about crinkle this thing up, put it in a pint little mason jar, seal it with the ring on the top with the little square cutout tablecloth patch thing down over the top for presentation. But I won't. But, you know, I probably could. I almost could. But I won't. <laughs>